right, uh, Raf Giello here and welcome to the second RT Soccer Podcast episode of this International Week. On Sunday, Ireland will continue the Euro 2024 qualifying campaign by hosting the Netherlands at the Viva Stadium, a match that will be live on RT2, the RT player. Lots of radio coverage as well and updates on rte.ie slash sport. Uh, we want to get an insight on Ronald Coleman's team and where Dutch football is at, among a couple of other talking points. So I'm delighted to be joined by Dutch journalist Bart Vlietstra, who is a football writer for De Volksgrant, also co-editor-in-chief of Santos magazine and a contributor to The Guardian. Bart, thanks very much uh, for taking the time. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and you're probably in a better mood than I am. Obviously, the Republic of Ireland lost uh, 2-0 to France, not unexpected uh, last night in Paris, whereas the Dutch uh, come into this game on Sunday off the back of a 3-0 victory against uh, Greece uh, with uh, Martin Daroon, Gakpo and Weghorst scoring all the goals in the first half. And I was just curious uh, in terms of the performance, was it a step up from the Netherlands or um, was it just sort of like a job well done and they're just moving on? No, it was a major step up because we had some really bad results, really bad games in the Nation League final against France. We were blown away. Um, everybody was critical. Um, there was a lot of criticism on this generation. How good are they? How tough are they? Uh, are they willing to um, uh, correct each other? That was uh, one main topic that uh, actually the head coach, Ronald Koeman, uh, pointed out before this match. Um, he had some question marks about um, the willingness to correct each other. He thought, well, maybe it's too cozy to be here. It's too nice of an atmosphere. Um, yeah, uh, Kuman changed the system. We went from 4-3-3, which is our uh, uh, <laughs> a national treasure in Holland, um, because it was indicted by Johan Cruyff. Um, everybody has to play 4-3-3. But um, Kuman uh, changed the system to three five two or five three two. Um, that was also played under Louis van Gaal at the World Cup. We didn't really play good there, but we well, we managed to make it to penalties against the world champion Argentina, so it wasn't too bad. Ronald Kuman always said, "Well, I'll stick to four three three," but he came back from that. He played three five two. He said afterwards he took a big risk. Uh, in doing that because if the result wouldn't be good then his head would be on the table I don't know if that's the right expression uh, I think on, on the chopping block I think it's on the, the chopping gets... block yeah. exactly well that's exactly what he said on the chopping block but it worked out perfectly I mean the first half was better than we've seen in well in in, in a long time first half was 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 uh, explicit uh, good there was uh, high pressure um, there was uh, determination there was a work, a good working spirit. There were good combinations. There were some excellent goals, three excellent goals. Um, uh, so yeah, we were we were really thrilled with with the first half. Second half was a bit slow, but okay, three 0 up, uh, saving energy for the island game. Um, everybody understood that, but uh, especially Kuman himself. But everybody was really delighted with the first half. Yeah, you mentioned the change of formation. Obviously, as you said, 4-3-3 had been used yeah. like in the 4-0 defeat to France at the start of the group. And then also in the Nations League games, uh, which was on home on Dutch soil against uh, Croatia and then against Italy. Now, as you said, he's reverted back to what is like a 5-3-2, 3-5-2. Yeah. Where, so did this come internally from him or was there a little bit of pressure from the media? Because I know, as you said, traditionally Dutch football has based itself on 4-3-3 and that's sort of like the staple idea well yes some um a big split amongst dutch media one half is cruyff minded and says no it always has to be 4-3-3 i mean with 3-5-2 there's never any attractive football and we are the country of attractive football so we should stick to that there's another group says no van gaal is our master van gaal has has the best results this is the system of the future this gives us defensive stability and it gives us also a lot of options by attacking from the wing backs. We have a fantastic um, uh, wing back, Dumfries, who can play in this system. Uh, well, he played in this system also in the European Championships of 21. Uh, he had a great role, role and yesterday again he had three assists. 
I mean, he's not the most technically gifted player, but he's so strong and he's got so much determination and, and power to get into the box even. And um, yeah, he, he, he was really the... Yeah, the best player yesterday, and uh, this system suits him really well. Um, it's kind of strange um, putting on a system for not your most talented player, but well, when he when he plays that when he has so much um, result from his game, then why not? Yeah. So I'm... that's yeah, that's that's kind of the how 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 things are uh, are are in Holland now. Yeah, and you know, in the long term, has the debate shaken to a point that um, you know, four two three is going to be left behind uh, completely, or is it uh, a question of also, you know, there's a issues with player production at the moment in terms of having high quality players? Is it more a question of this is we have to make do with this system because of the quality of players we what we currently have? Yeah, I wouldn't uh, rule out that he will change back. Uh, especially against the um, yeah the the small the smaller countries, but Greece isn't a top nation. They weren't at the World Cup. Um, they have a good side, I think, but they didn't really play well yesterday. Um, still, uh, he imposed three central defenders. We got a lot of good central defenders at the moment with Van Dijk, of course, with uh, Ake. We have uh, Geert Truida at Feyenoord who had a really good season. We have Timber who is injured now. Um, Frankie de Jong can play from the back in this system. So um, yeah, we we if you look at the at the players that you got, then yeah, this is this is really I think it's really a good uh, good option. We play with one central striker, Wout Weghorst, who works his ass off, and um, behind that we got two really talented playmakers or, or or wingers playmakers um, they're they're a little bit in between Xavi Simons and Godi Kakpo so I think we have all the good players for this system to play um, on the left I'm not really sure you have Daily Blind um, who started out well at Girona but I see him more as a centre back than as a left wing back so yeah maybe a question mark and I, one thing I'm curious about, just in terms of what the Dutch view is on the quality of players you currently have uh, in the national team, because obviously you've had some golden generations, the 1970s, mm -hmm. one with Cruyff and Johan Neskens, and then um, the 1980s with Hullet and Van Basten, then the 90s generation maybe didn't achieve a huge amount, but a great collection of players. And then the final one that got to the 2010 World Cup final with Van Persie and Schneider and yeah. um, with Robin, you know, that was a, that was a very strong group since then. It doesn't, uh, they don't, they don't seem to have produced too many great attacking players, some great no. defenders, but what's the Dutch view on that? Is it, um, exactly. is it just a sense that maybe it's just a, uh, you know, this happens with, you know, smaller sized nations and smaller populations that, you have to wait um, for generations to come along or are there question marks about the pipelines at the moment in terms of how players are being produced? Mm, there are some question marks about that because although we are a small country, we have a fantastic football structure in developing youth players. We have so many good pitches here. We have so many youth coaches. There's such a good organization in Holland. Um, that's why yeah, we're most of the time we are there at the World Cups, at the European Championships. I think that's still our big secret. Attacking wise, um, yeah, that's that's strange. I mean, we're already depending on Memphis Depay for for many years now as our sole really good central striker. I mean, that course is 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 a useful player, but 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 shouldn't be your first striker, I believe. Um, yeah, that that that's that's strange because uh, in the youth, especially um, a lot of um, is installed to let strikers um, develop. Maybe there is too much, um, yeah, there's too much emphasis emphasized on um, uh, combination football, you know, and not on uh, one on ones and uh, let them go, let them play as they want to play, let them go uh, past five, six players. No, a lot of youth coaches, and maybe myself too, because I'm a youth coach too, um, you think too much of the result and not enough on the development of the individual players. 
Um, and then you get that you, uh, yeah, you organize your team very well. You focus on the defense and no goals uh, against. And then a play the ball, play the ball. Because if you pass players, you pass players, you lose the ball. You're tired. You have to come back. We get a goal against. I think that is, yeah, maybe a mentality change that has to come. In the early years, you had the street football or you played on the squares. You had no rules. You had no youth coaches telling you what to do. So maybe, yeah, there there are some 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 talks about getting more back to that. Yeah, and in terms of the roles of the the big clubs, so obviously Ajax are having a little bit of difficulty in terms of their when it comes to the first team at the moment. And, and Feyenoord obviously coming in as league champions, but both clubs, particularly Ajax, have a huge um, history in terms of producing players. So what's yeah. their role at the moment in terms of that sort of slight decline in terms of uh, particularly attacking players coming through? Yeah, well. Um... There is one factor is that uh, the most creative players are um, a lot of times not of Dutch origin. I mean, um, they have uh, parents from Morocco or from Suriname or from elsewhere. And those players, uh, sometimes they choose to play for Morocco. Uh, you know, Hakim Ziyech is one of the most creative players. He's, he, he was born in, in Holland and grown up there, but he chose to play for Morocco. Maybe that is one thing. I mean, I mean, he would be a great player for Holland. Um, yeah, otherwise, um, Ajax really, I think, uh, tend to um, yeah buy uh, experienced players to qualify for the Champions League. They have to qualify for the Champions League because of their uh, financial situation. I mean, they pay so big wages that they have to qualify for the Champions League. And then you get... Um, uh, and then they tend to buy more experienced players or the biggest, biggest talents in the world and not give uh, their own youth uh, the possibilities to to come through. Yeah. So, so that could be a, an explanation. I mean, we had a great uh, generation with Donny van der Beek, with Frenkie de Jong, with Matthijs de Ligt. But still not really um, uh, Dutch attacking power. Um, attacking is the most hard thing in football and uh, also in Holland we are sometimes being maybe too realistic about that so that will, won't help attacking players develop. Yeah, which is interesting because uh, in terms of Irish football and our association from the mid 2000s onwards, we tended to recruit Dutch, uh, Dutch, you know, coaches and technical coaches as a, a you know heading up our high performance uh, mm -hmm. uh, units, which Vim Coverman, so who I think was part of the Euro eighty eight squad, was yeah, the was initial part of and, the squad didn't yeah, play, but yeah. yeah, and then Rude, Rude Doctor succeeded him here in Ireland. So it's a kind of interesting. We went uh, towards the Dutch, but obviously, as you're pointing out, there's there's issues there. But uh, yeah. in terms of uh, the lineup on Sunday, so you know the it was the three five two formation. Do you think uh, Coleman is going to stick with that in Dublin, or is he? It, and what changes is he likely to make to the starting lineup? No, he won't change anything. Uh, only Ake because he, he was injured. So maybe he will be replaced by Stefan de Vrij. But uh, he won't make any change because this worked out perfectly. It would be crazy to to change now. Oh, he won't change. I mean, even the goalie played a great match. Uh, Mark Flecken, he's now playing at Brentford. He's so good with his feet. And that gives the game so much more speed. And that's so important. Also, he's big, he's strong. Yeah, he, he, fine. And we had some troubles with our goalies, but um, yeah, he, he did really well. So maybe that's that's also a, a solution now for this problem. Um, yeah, um, I think this team is the best team at the moment. So no, he won't make any changes. Um, coming from the bench, we also have some other attacking options with Noah Lang. Um, uh, so... Yeah, it's. I, th I think he'll stick with this. Yeah, yeah. and uh, tactically then, I expect in terms of the playmaking, everything just runs through Frankie de Jong. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if I can give you guys one advice, just mark him down with one or two men and then you get the angle of the Dutch uh, game uh, solved. Martin de Roon is, uh, is, is much worse at passing. I mean, he's a good ball conqueror. And he's a good he's a good soldier to Frankie de Jong. But if you let Martin de Roo 
do the playmaking, yeah, then then it's much 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 less than when Frankie de Jong gets his freedom. Frankie de Jong is in great shape though. He can avoid um, the man the man marking him. Um, <laughs> so you have to stop Frankie, and then you can stop Holland. I think. Still, yeah. then there is a lot of individual quality up front with Gakpo and Simons. So, yeah, because they're they're both kind of interesting players. Obviously, Gakpo we see a lot of because he's a, he's been at yeah. Liverpool now for a little while, and uh, Simons on the other hand, I remember him. He was one of those kind of YouTube footballers you'd see in terms of like youth footballers coming through when he was at yes. Barcelona. Then he yeah. went to PSG, and I thought yeah. maybe his career is um because obviously PSG has its issues in terms of bringing true players. And but then I've seen him now uh getting opportunities in you know with with Dutch clubs and now with RB Leipzig, and he seems to be you know on a good trajectory. So they're two interesting talents. Yeah, Simons was really exciting uh, player last season. I mean, he was 19 years old and he was the best player in our league, which says a lot. Then uh, I think he made a really good step to Leipzig because there they have a lot of uh, eye for developing, also physically, also uh, in reaction wise. Uh, the German league is much tougher than than the Dutch league. I think he did really well. He started really well, and he is such a yeah, he's such a he's just the kind of player that that we were longing for, you know, initiative, um, intuitive uh, player, uh, does his tricks, does his magic. Um, he's not a, he's not afraid to take on everybody. Um, he's intelligent. He's technically he's perfect. He can finish off really well. He has an eye for his for his colleagues. So yeah, we we have really high expectations of him and. Yeah, finally, we have such a player like we had in the past with Van der Vaart, Van Persie, uh, Ruben, uh, yeah, Johan Cruyff, of course, uh, yeah, Vandenberg in the past. Uh, yeah, we finally got one, we think. Yeah, and uh, one other player I did want to mention was, of course, Virgil van Dijk, who's been one yeah. of the best defenders in the world and yeah. best defenders of his generation. But since that injury he picked up in the Merseyside derby in October yeah. 2020, it feels like, you know, he's gone from 100% to maybe something like 97, 98%. Like, what's the what's the general view of him in the Netherlands in terms of his form in recent times and also what his personality is like as a captain of the national team? His personality is fantastic. I mean, he is the 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 the, the, the big captain, big verge, and he it, it was interesting during Corona. You had no spectators in the stadium. The only one you heard was Virgil van Dijk, constantly coaching, uh, shouting, uh, telling everybody what to do. And you don't see those kind of players anymore often now. So he's really vital in that part. Uh, true at Liverpool, he's he's get he's getting up some criticism. Um, the injury hasn't done him good, um, but in this system with three central defenders, especially with Ake on his side, who is in the best form of his life, um, yeah, that's that that's that helps him uh, in his game. At the World Cup, he got some criticism from from Boston, like not really standing up as a leader. Hmm. Yesterday you saw you saw a true leader uh, in him. Also with the media, he he has a really good um, yeah. He's got really good quotes and lines uh, and 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 a really good attitude towards that. So he's still really important uh, for this team. Also he has a really long history with Ronald Koeman at Southampton already. So um, they know each other well. So he'll be uh, he will still still be vital for Holland. And uh, what's the general view of Ireland as well and Irish football? I mean, currently, obviously, we've had our run-ins in the past uh, at major tournaments, whether it was Euro yeah. 88, Italia 90, USA 94, and then that famous game at Lansdowne yeah. Road here in uh, 2001 when we went to the World Cup. And uh, unfortunately for you guys, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> you, you had to stay at home um, for that World Cup. But uh, generally, obviously, things have changed now. But what is the view of uh, of Irish football? Well, if we if you say McAteer in Holland, then everybody gets the shivers. I mean, we will never forget that. Um, that was a that was a that was an astonishing game on Lansdowne Road. I remember uh, I was a young journalist back then, and I called. I had some phone calls with Paul McGrath, who was a really, really, really big hero for me. I mean, such an inspiration. I mean, playing on that level with no knees, with all his problems, you know, that he had, and such a 
incredibly nice guy. I mean, fantastic guy talking to me, being so kind. Um, yeah, with his career, with his reputation at Aston Villa. Um, that's what I remember from that. But going to now, yeah, well, we don't really know a lot about uh, the Irish team, if I, if I have to be honest. Not not many players uh, come to mind. I mean, uh, some good goalkeepers there, uh, of course. But um, yeah, Josh Cullen is is a good player. But 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 and and Evan Ferguson, of course, the striker. Yeah, but I think he's injured. injured isn't he? Yeah, he's injured, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, so he's missing this entire. entire yeah, window. so you haven't really got uh, the big big talents at the moment. I think that you had in the eighties, nineties. And also um, in in the two thousands, I think. Yeah. Um. That's that's a bit lacking now. I mean, the the players they aren't playing. At, uh, none of almost none of them are playing at the big clubs. Um. So. Um, yeah, it's typically Dutch then to underestimate them, and that's that's the real danger I think here for Holland. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, they underestimated to a point that we actually might get something because we do need we do need a victory. But there is one player playing in or will be playing in the Netherlands this season. That's Troy yeah. Paris. So he's not the first Irish player to go there. I mean, Frank Stapleton back in the eighties briefly was at Ajax. Then David yeah. Connolly at Feyenoord, Connolly, and Excelsior, yeah, yeah. and uh, and Jack Byrne um, was at Cambour uh, very briefly a few years ago. But yeah, Paris has gone to Excelsior now on loan from Tottenham. Um, still a young player. He's had a few loan spells in England. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's uh, what can he expect at Excelsior? What type of club is it in terms of what he's gonna what he's gonna be facing? It's the smallest club in the league, um, but it's a really cozy club. I live really nearby and. Um, they have a good eye for developing players. I mean, there's a really good player at Feyenoord now, Mats Wiefer. He came from Excelsior. Nobody wanted him. He he put on his own video of his highlights. Only Excelsior gave him a chance, and he really blossomed there. And now he's one. Now he's an international player for Holland. He's in the in the squad. Um, so Excelsior is really a, a breeding room for 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 talent. It's really a nice, relaxed place. It's a really small stadium, but it's in a really nice neighborhood of Rotterdam and um, there's there's never pressure there so you can't really feel uh, there um, uh, so, so I think it's a really good environment to uh, to, uh, to 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 develop uh, only thing against it is that they have artificial grass um, and so that's not good but um, yeah and yeah but but it's a good it's a good club they have really good coaches I mean the striker coach Thomas Fahar is is a really really good coach. Uh, the head coach Marinus Dijkos has been a central striker himself. So yeah, it's a good place to be for an attacking player. I think. Yeah, so we'll be following his uh, progress with interest. But one final point, and it uh, relates to Vera Pau. So now, former Republic of Ireland women's manager, um, once used to be the Dutch women's manager as well from 2004 to 2010. But yeah. um, she's obviously ha- not had her contract renewed by our football association here, the no. FAI, after the World Cup. And what was interesting, what you'd said to me before we did this interview was there has been there's been no real reaction in our homeland mm-hmm. to what has happened in the last couple of months? No, hardly. I mean, she did a big interview in Holland about what happened to her um, in terms of, um, how do you say, I don't know the proper English word for that, but um, um, uh, being harassed um, at the Dutch FA uh, several times. That was big news. Now, yeah, no, that that's not really much up. I mean, uh, the focus is on the our own national teams, on the Dutch uh, Dutch lionesses, on um, on uh, Sarina Wiegman, of course, with the English team. So that's the that's the mere focus on it. Uh, there there hasn't been a, a lot of upset on uh, on the Vera Pau case, if I'm honest. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. And just in terms of the World Cup itself, from a Dutch perspective, um, you know, he got to a quarterfinals, beaten by mm. the, the eventual champion Spain. Um, mm. and this is only four years on from reaching the the final. So, how big how big was it, um, in the Netherlands, in, in terms of like capturing attention? Uh, more and more and more and more. I mean, women's football is really growing here, and we had a, a lot of good results, uh, obviously, in the in the last couple of years under Sarina Wiegman. Um. Yeah, the, 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 there's 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 some transition in generations. Um, 
we had a really good uh, generation that became the European Championship and it reached the World Cup final. But now uh, new players have to come through. They are coming through, but it takes time. Um, we had some okay matches there, some lesser matches there. It was it was like uh, six and a half, seven as a great for, for this team. Spain was just the better side. I mean, they were the best side there. And knowing that they didn't even have all their good players there, um, it makes them the big favorites for the future. And we have to get to that level. And I think it will be tough to get there in the next couple of years. And uh, before I let you go, just if you were to make a prediction, and I, I know predictions are kind of pointless because it's, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, I it's, hate uh, it, yeah, I hate, <laughs> I hate them as well. But if you were to sort of tip it on Sunday, which way it's going to go, I presume you're expecting Netherlands to, to edge a win. Or do you think just given it's in Dublin and Ireland sometimes play well against some of the stronger teams that maybe it might be a lot closer? Yeah, I think it's typical for Holland to 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 play uh, to play terrible after a good game. So um, still, I think they will win, but it won't be easy. I think a uh, uh, one-two in the final minutes, we will we will we'll, we'll get the decider through uh, one of our substitutes, Noah Lang. Uh, that's my prediction. All one right. two. Yeah, well, anyway, the podcast <laughs> the podcast will be back on Monday where we'll be joined by some of our regular pundits to review Ireland's international break and also look ahead to the upcoming fixtures in the League of Ireland FAI Cup. But uh, Bart, thanks very much for your time. Yes. You didn't do much for my sense of optimism anyway on Sunday with that prediction, sorry. but, but we'll, yeah, we'll, have to we'll be survive. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, uh, thanks for your time. Wish you all the best of luck. Thanks, man. Cheers.